Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we are going to be continuing on that totalitarian train. Choo choo. And we're going to be talking about, you guessed it, Joseph Stalin. <sighs> all right. So, uh, we're nearing we're nearing the end, people. We're getting close. All right. Um, if you uh, spell out the acronym of this title, it makes sus. And that is all uh, about Stalin. Stalin is sus. He's just a sus kind of guy. Yeah. All right, chapter 13, section four. That was your warm up. All right, so totalitarian state. So you remember uh, that guy with the epic beard, Karl Marx, and he predicted what? He predicted that the working class would overthrow and create a communist. A working class would overthrow the middle class and create a communist classless society. Well, under Stalin, however, the opposite effect actually occurred. And Stalin turned the Soviet Union into a totalitarian state controlled by a powerful and complex bureaucracy. Um, FYI, um, Lenin, uh, you know, died in what, 1923? Uh, they loved him so much, they embalmed him, and his body is still, what do you want to call it, exalted? I, I, I won't say exalted, but uh, the place where he is resting is in the, the Red Square. So if you remember back at the World Cup, um, what was that, 2018? Um, in the in Russia, you know, they always commented about being in the Red Square. Um, that's where his body is laid to rest, and he looks just like that. Um, oh, extra credit question. Starting it off hot. Um, what is the process that they use to keep him and his skin still intact? I know it's embalming technique, blah, 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 blah. But how do they keep it so preserved like he's still alive? It's creepy. It's creepy. I just want to know. All right, this is Joseph Daddy Stalin. Um, nice mustache, Wario. <laughs> if you remember the uh, epic rap battle of history. Um was the USSR ready for Stalin? Remember, from now on in history until 1990, 1989, 1991, whatever year you believe is the ending of the Soviet Union, they were called the Soviet Union, not Russia. So don't be writing Russia on your testa, okay? Um, once in power, Stalin imposed government control over the USSR's economy. Uh, he said that Russia had suffered enough from its economic backwardness. Hallelujah! Someone finally said it. In 1928, he proposed the first of his several five-year plans, which aimed at building heavy industry, improving transportation, increasing farm output. Test question, that was. The government took control of all economic activity. The government owned all businesses and distributed all resources. How is that different from Karl Marx? You can't say, you can't say that what Stalin and to a degree, what Lenin and Stalin were doing was pure communism because it's not. They developed their own form of communism, okay? The, gov the government, Marx didn't say the government gonna take control of all this. No, Marx did not say that, okay? Um, I don't know why I said a southern accent. Oh man, I'm such a clown. Um, but yeah, that is not to a degree, that's not the definition of Marxism. Um, and 
through the government controlling everything, they developed a command economy where government officials made all basic econ economic econ economic decisions. So the the government is going to say at what price you're going to sell your crop and what price you're going to sell your shoes and the price that you're going to sell your coal on the international market and you're going to live with it. Who knows how rich they could have actually been if they actually competed with their resources at a competitive competitive price. Mm. Anywho, mixed results. Um, why? Uh, the five-year plan set high production goals and heavy industry and transportation. Government. The government is going to push their workers and managers to meet these goals by giving them bonuses to those who succeeded and punish those who did not. Between 1928 and 1939, large factories, hydroelectric power stations, and huge industrial complexes rose all across the Soviet Union. Oil, coal, and steel production grow. Mining expanded and new railroads, RRs, railroads were built. However, despite all this progress, workers had little to show for their efforts. Um, the standard of living remained low. Central planning was inefficient, which led to surpluses in some areas and shortages in others. And this focus on meeting quantity, not quality. And I always give this example where you have a shoemaking company and all of a sudden in the shoemaking process, they run out of material to make the soles of the shoe, rubber, right? No matter, um, this shoemaking company would still continue churning out shoes without soles. So you would have a bunch of soleless shoes, but hey, that business, that company, uh, that particular shoemaking company met their quota. It doesn't say that they had to have soles, they're just shoes. Yeah, we may be shoes, yeah. So focusing on the quantity, not the quality. All right, that's like going back to when Russia, see, see, see the switch, Russia in World War I would send out um, their, their soldiers to fight without bullets. Yeah, you got a gun? Be, be useful. Oh, man. So yeah, forced collectivization. Okay, uh, I believe this is a test question. So under government control, ag under government control, what am I? Agriculture was under government control in the Soviet Union. Uh, Stalin and the government are going to urge farmers to produce more grain to feed the workers in the cities and hope to sell grain abroad. Remember the NEP. Remember, remember. Um, small farmers prospered under it, right? Small farmers, okay, I, I did not say, I never said that small businesses just ballooned in profits. Never said that, never, 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 never. And the net was, remember the, uh, the capitalist, uh, the capitalist compromise to ensure some growth after the war communism uh, under Lenin wasn't working so hot, bringing in some capitalist uh, methods turned their economy right round. But Stalin saw the NEP as a threat to state power. He saw it as inefficient. And so does Mr. Ovalle. Um So Stalin's gonna be like, all right, screw these individual farmers, screw these uh, small businesses. Um, we're going to want all peasants to be farming on state-owned farms called collectives. All right. The government, again, the government is going to provide the means of production. Tractors, fertilizer, better seed, and the peasants learned modern agriculture techniques. Now, that might be all nice and handy, but you don't know how that information was disseminated to the workers, you know, to the farmers. They might have just said, do this. I don't know. Um, again, like I said, the state set all prices and controlled access to farm supplies. So you couldn't, you couldn't 
if you were living on a collective, which sounds a lot like sharecropping in the United States after the Civil War, if you were living on a collective and you wanted, you know, get some get some grain, get some get some uh, crops on the side. On, again, the Southern accent. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, you couldn't, since it's a state-owned farm and they control the means of production, you couldn't like sneak in, get a plow or whatever, a reaper, cut down some grain, and then you know sell on the underground black black market in the Soviet Union. Okay. But I bet there was some attempt at this. I'm not. I'm not saying that there, there wasn't. Um, okay. Another another test question. The peasants refused to give up their lands and to uh, uh, and to refuse to sell their crops at low prices because hello, if you're selling crops at low prices, you're not making much for the farmer. So they're going to resist. How? by killing their own farm animals, destroying tools, and actually burning their own crops. And that is gonna piss off Daddy Stalin so much, so much. Um, so Stalin believed that these kulaks, okay, or wealthy farmers were behind it all because they're, you know, they're wealthy farmers. They don't wanna give up their land to sell at mediocre prices. That's no, 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 no. You're gonna put them out of bed news. So uh, Stalin responded by force. Um, again, being being uh, suspect of these kulaks without having real proof, uh, the government will seize the kulaks' lands and send them to labor camps where they were then killed or died, uh, killed or died, killed because they resisted or they died from overworking. Okay, uh, and these. Gu, uh, these labor camps are called gulags. Gulags. Okay, in response to quote de-kulakization, what your book says, uh, angry peasants only made enough supply, only enough to supply themselves, and not like sell the quantity that they that the government was demanding them to make. They only made it enough for themselves to live by. Uh, so that's going to lead to more government uh, intervention to seize their lands and purposely leaving them to starve. Comes to bite them in the bud. And this is going to lead to a terrible famine across the Soviet Union called the terror famine. So between five and eight million people died alone in the Ukraine. And if you don't know the Ukraine, uh, it's kind of in the middle, um, middle southern. If you're, if if we're thinking of the Soviet Union across, they're kind of in the south southwest of the Soviet Union, and they're the nickname for the Ukraine is called like the breadbasket. So it's very uh, arable land that you can grow a ton of crops on. Stalin, however, did not achieve what he wanted, and feeding the population will become a major problem throughout Stalin's reign. Always. Always, always, always trying to feed his people. And the terror is just beginning, people. He's going to use terror as a weapon against his own people. Hello, that's what uh, totalitarianism is all about. It's almost like terror, totalitarianism. I don't know what I'm talking about. Anywho, he's going to perpetuate crimes against humanity and violate his people's own individual rights. Police spies did not hesitate to open letters or replace listening devices in homes or uh, other businesses. Uh, nothing appeared in print without full official approval of the government. There was no free press and there was no safe voicing of discontent of the government. Those who did were rounded up and sent to the gulag. Again, it was brutal labor camps. Um, I don't know why I put the word right there when it needs to be on the preview. Anywho, yeah, brutal labor camps. Um, you could also, I mean, it's basically jail too. Um, the paranoia is real, people. The paranoia is real. So I think this is the test question. Um, it's a lot of thinking, I know. <laughs> Even though he was an absolute leader, like he ruled absolutely, not like, 
I'm not saying that. Okay. Even though he was an, he ruled absolutely, Stalin still feared his rival party leaders were plotting against him. Kind of how he got rid of Trotsky. Um, he was always paranoid from the person below him. Always. Paranoia, paranoia. So 1934, he launched the Great Purge, where he used the secret police to crack down on the old Bolsheviks who were still around from the revolution times who were, you know, more pro-Lenin and anti stalin He then expanded his search to targeting old war heroes, industrial managers, writers, and ordinary citizens um, who, did not, who he thought did not like him. They would be charged with counter-revolutionary plots or failure to meet production quotas. So, you know, they could look at all the information that they're calculating and be like, this store owner is not meeting this quota for the last six months, arrest him. It's that simple. So from 1936 to 1938, there will be staged trials in Moscow where former Communist Party leaders confess to all kinds of crimes once after being tortured uh, or threatened with the lives of their families. So around 4 million people were purged during his reign. Although some suggest his toll is higher. And um, what was it? That was one, one of the slides from uh, the Civil War, right? Uh, the Russian Civil War lecture, 11.5, where uh, I showed you that like map and I was like, no, oh, you don't need to write, you don't need to write red, write the red stuff, uh, you know, between, it was, I think it was said between five and 20 million were killed. Five to 20 million were killed. 20 million being the highest. Can you met 20 million people. So the purge and its results, obviously it's going to increase Stalin's power and his paranoia. Uh, all Soviet citizens were aware of what could happen if you had a shred of disloyalty, loyalty, loyalty. Stalin's government is going to pay the price, though. So among those who were purged were experts in industry, economics, engineering, and many of the most talented Soviet Union uh, thinkers and writers. This also included his nation's military leaders and half of their military officers, a toll that would burden Stalin when Germany came knocking on the Soviet Union's door in 1941. Um, so some, that was some foreshadow, but some uh, continuing on. So some brainwash. <coughs> Stalin tried to boost uh, morale and faith in the communist system by making himself a godlike figure. He is going to use propaganda as a tool to build a quote, cult of personality around himself talk about one talk about being so paranoid but then one on the other hand being so self-confident that you consider yourself godlike again trying to differentiate because people people love lenin so much you guys don't understand and he is so paranoid to win over his people that he is going to make himself be considered godlike. If you make yourself be this immortal image saying you can't die, then hey, look, look at your look at your guy, Lenin. He died. I'm still here. This is, you know, it is what it is. Radios and loudspeakers will blare into factories and villages and movie movies, theaters, and schools. Citizens heard about communist successes in the evils of capitalism. Mm. Boo. Uh, there will be posters urging workers to meet or exceed production quotas. Do your part, get your pay. Um, hello? Okay, that was weird. I didn't hit exit. <laughs> Awkward. So here's a uh, here's some propaganda. I have no idea what that means. You can look it up. 
All right, so censorship. So during the Bolshevik Revolution, writers, artists had greater uh, sense of freedom under Stalin, not so much. The government controlled what books were published, what music was heard, and what art would be displayed. Stalin are gonna, is going to require artists and writers to create works in a new style called socialist <laughs> realism. And the goal was to show Soviet life in a positive manner and promote hope for the future. And uh, this is going to follow in the footsteps of authors such as Tolstoy and Chekhov. Uh, if you want to know more, it's in your book. Uh, and if they refuse, writers, artists, and composers would face persecution. You know, go to the go to the gulag, bro. Okay. Russification. Hey, another form of Russification. Um, it should be called Sovietication. I don't know why. But uh, this is kind of the same along the lines of, uh, what is that? Uh, from the Romanov leaders, Russification by your boy, was it Alexander II? Uh, so Stalin is going to promote the policy of Russification to control cultural life of the Soviet Union. He's going to make the nationality culture more Russian. So in 1936, uh, the Soviet Union was made up of 11 Soviets, Russia being the largest one. Obviously, Soviets you can think of as like, I'm going to, I'm going to call it individual countries because when the Soviet Union breaks up, they split off. Um, so you can kind of think of it that way. Uh, Soviet is like, it's just, it's just a weird way, okay? At first, Stalin encouraged the autonomy of the Uzbek and Ukrainian cultures, but um, in the late 20s, he's gonna flip themselves on their head and he's gonna require everybody, everybody, everybody to speak Russian. Oh my, hello? Losing my religion. Um, okay, so in order to strengthen its hold on uh, the government, its government's hold on the minds of its people, uh, Stalin had to destroy their religious faith. In terms with Marx, which he, you know, has a copy of the manifesto with him, atheism is the way to go. Um, so he's going, so Russification kind of differs here. Um, so he's going to attack the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, most of their leaders would be killed in the purge or sent to the gulags. Catholics, Jews, and Islam uh, would uh, all be persecuted. And he is going to try to promote his own religion with, quote, sacred texts of Karl Marx and V.I. Lenin. Again, trying to win his people over. They see how much they love Lenin. All right, well, let's put what Lenin was writing about. Let's put what Karl Marx is writing about. Let's make our own religion. So I think this is the last slide. Nope, two more. Um, communists had destroyed the old social order of landowning nobles at the top and peasants at the bottom and the small middle class, if you remember, remember, remember. Um, instead of creating a society full of equals, create a society where few elite groups will emerge. Obviously, the Communist Party would still be in charge and very few Soviets could join. Benefits and not so benefits. Oh man, okay, now there's two more slides. Um, most people enjoyed these new benefits. The party is gonna require children to attend free communist built schools, okay. Uh, the state supported technical schools and universities because hey, they needed to industrialize, way to do that build stuff. Uh, they're going to teach communist values. And they're going to glorify farm collectives. And of course, Daddy Stalin. Um, the educated workers were needed to build a more modern industrial state because, yeah, Russia was backwards. Uh, many still lack the necessities. They're going to build massive apartment complexes where housing would be scarce. They're People just don't have enough money to say, hey, let's go here because this is still industrialization people and you know, wages are kept low, working hours are kept long, working conditions are horrible. Who knows if these massive apartment complexes even had running water, yada, yada, yada. Living conditions sucked, everything sucked. Okay. 
Quimmin. All right, so this is the last slide. Anywho, long before 17, 1917, women like Nadezhda Krupskaya and Alexandra Kol Kolontai um, worked for the revolution to spread revolutionary among, spread ideas among peasants and workers, can't talk. And under communists, women won equality under the law. Wow, women. Um, they're going to gain access to education and a wide range of jobs. Will, uh, women helped contribute to Soviet growth in the labor industry. They worked in factories, constructed, construction, and collectives. And they brought more money home since salaries were, even though salaries were still low, they still brought more money because, hey, they don't have to stay at home. They can go out, they can work, they can come home, more money. You know, I try, I try this way. Ew. Well, guess who we'll be talking about tomorrow. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, that's uh that's our that's our guy, Stalin. Um so yeah, uh your homework is page 447. Three through seven, not six, not five, three through seven. Okay, so uh, just an extra question. And yeah, um, hopefully you guys did enjoy. If you did, make sure you smash that like button. And as always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.